To crack the ancient secret that previous civilizations left behind, we meet with world-renowned physicist, Dr. Brooks Agnew. Author of two national bestsellers, his published works include thousands of technical papers comprised of solutions and theories regarding fields of advanced mathematics and physics. In addition to North Arctic explorations and continued research in his Virginia-based laboratory, Dr. Agnew has conducted over 30 years of combined research, providing invaluable contributions to several organizations, including NASA and Jet Propulsion Laboratories. Dr. Agnew also conducts open discussions with the scientific community and members of the public through his nationally acclaimed radio show, which is currently the fastest growing scientific talk program in North America. Um, Dr. Agnew, there's evidence, scientific evidence, of prior pole shifts. Some of the evidence is geological. Uh, for instance, uh, along the Arctic Circle, in Norway or in Nordic regions. There's a lot of ancient volcanic activity. A lot of magma and lava came up out of the ground. Well, the thing about uh, lava or magma is when it, when it freezes or becomes solid, it assumes the magnetic alignment of the planet at that moment. And in that region of the country, there is a broad band of magnetic alignments for rocks that have never moved from their location which indicates that at the moment that that lava came out of the ground and solidified, the planet was at a different alignment. Now, is that a magnetic pole shift or geographic pole shift? And what's the difference? Well, there are, you're right, there are two. For geographic, it actually uh, implies that the planet itself tilted during this volcanic eruption, and that as it tilted, each rock froze at a different magnetic alignment. A pole shift is where the actual magnetic field around the planet pulsates to a point where the north and south poles swap. Well, if it was a geographic pole shift, the alignment of the planet with the sun would change. The sun would come up at a different spot than it normally does. It would come up in the west instead of the east or the north instead of the south, related basically how we sit on, on the earth now. And that could change everything, weather patterns, migratory patterns, all kinds of biological blooming, everything could change on the planet. At one point, the North and South Pole were perfectly perpendicular to the sun. That is to say, the sun was right over the equator. The polar caps were very small. The Earth may have been at a temperature equilibrium because there's no winter and summer. There's no season change. But there was an event that occurred, probably cosmological event, that pulled the Earth around on its axis so that now the North Pole and South Pole lean toward the Sun depending on where the Earth is in its orbit around the Sun. What's happening on the crust of the Earth is absolutely cataclysmic. Volcanoes and earthquakes and plate shifts and huge uh, tidal waves, and we're, we're talking about stacking the ocean up four, five, six thousand feet in the air on one side of the planet. Wouldn't an event like that, like, wipe out all life? It almost did. It almost did. It probably wiped out about 95 percent of life on the surface of the planet. This event you're referring to, did this occur over millions of years, or was this a sudden event? It's an interesting question. There's very little evidence that it would have occurred over millions or even billions of years. These kinds of events, as we have seen with just in our limited astronomical uh, life, that is to say, we've had telescopes for only so many centuries, uh, we have seen that these events occur suddenly in space. For instance, the Schumacher-Levy uh, comet that struck Jupiter. We, it was discovered, it was named, and it hit Jupiter within a single man's lifetime. So you're not talking about catastrophic disasters that happen, say, over decades. You're talking about disasters that happen within weeks or months, major cataclysm, which literally wipe out all life. Well, I don't know if it wipes out all life. Life has a, a great way of surviving, even in, in floods and tides of five and 6,000 feet high. People make their way to the mountains, they make their way to caves, the hardy survive, 
but they don't survive well. They don't survive with their technology. They don't survive with the best tools, but they do survive, and uh, they end up repopulating the Earth. When these geographic pole shifts occur, they have catastrophic effects on the Earth. Floods, earthquakes, tidal waves, um, shifting of continents. If the Earth was pre-populated to the extent that you're talking about, whereas uh, every culture on Earth has writings, ancient texts and writings regarding this event that you're describing. Where is the evidence of these civilizations today? The cities. Do you know where 90 percent of the population of the United States lives? Within 20 miles of a coast. It would not take much of a tidal wave that struck all the coasts to eliminate 90% of the population of this country. It is the same in all countries that are close to the water. Uh, these cities are, are quite easily wiped off the face of the earth. And especially when we're talking about rims or tectonic plates come together, these can simply just fold in on themselves and those cities could be a thousand feet below the ground, 10,000 feet below the ground. Uh, in the ocean, there's evidence of whole continents just sinking beneath the sea. Is there evidence to suggest that anything like this can happen again? Of course there is. There is a lot going on in the universe that we cannot see even with our orbiting telescopes. But we can feel the effects of it. We can feel gravitational effects, gravitational waves. We can feel dark energy and dark matter pulling on our solar system, pulling on our galaxy. Our Earth, for instance, goes through what's called the precession. The imaginary line that goes through the Earth from the North to South Pole draws a circle through the zodiac. We are about to finish that 26,000 year precession. December 21st, 2012 starts the age of Aquarius. It's well marked on all kinds of calendars, not the least of which is the uh, is the Mayan calendar, uh, the sunstone. Well, besides being the end of the procession, a lot of the ancient writers believed that there would be some cataclysm that occurred at that time. Uh, many of us believe that it won't just occur on that day, that there will be precursor uh, events, an increase in volcanoes, an increase in earthquakes and their intensity. Uh, fluctuations in the magnetic field around the Earth. Uh, one of the things that occurred uh, last year in October was something that's never occurred before. We had nine X-class flares. We have a scale that we measure solar flares on. X is the highest. Nine flares in one month. The peculiar thing was sunspot activity was very low. The precursor events you're talking about, um, weather changes, earthquake fluctuations, uh, storm intensities, these all seem to be occurring at a much more frequently rate, frequent rate as each year passes. Last year, um, within a six month period of time, we had two uh, level nine earthquakes in the same area. Um, last week, we had a uh, level five hurricane with 195 mile an hour winds in Australia way above the level five norm. Even, it would have been a six if there is such thing as a six. S massive storms are appearing everywhere. 13 foot falls uh, of snow in Japan this last winter within a matter of a few days. It's, it's unbelievable the amount of storms and the amount of events that are happening every year seem to be escalating more than the year before. Let's say hypothetically something is coming this way. Let's say it's coming now, and being very far away, it has a very slight gravitational effect on Earth. And each year that it gets closer, the gravitational effect on Earth is slightly greater than the year before. And that is directly or indirect, indirectly causing the increase in frequency and the increase in intensity of